With an intro, right? <clears throat> a brief intro. Introduction. My guest today is Shimon Peres, chairman of Israel's Labor Party, former Minister of Defense for the State of Israel, and many people predict the next Prime Minister of the State of Israel. My guest today is Shimon Peres, Chairman of Israel's Labor Party, former Minister of Defense for the State of Israel, and many people predict Israel's next Prime Minister. Mr. Perez, regardless of whether Labor is in power or the Likud is in power, do you really realistically see a situation where any Arab leader is going to follow Sadat's lead recognize Israel's right to exist and seek to make peace with the State of Israel? My answer is yes, because I believe that peace became an urgent need for the Arab countries as well, not just for us. The prospect of going on with belligerency is becoming as dangerous as one may think of for the Arab countries as well as for us. So I don't think that by making peace we are doing a favor to the Arabs or the Arabs are doing a favor to us. Do you see anyone specifically? Would you figure that King Hussein is the mo most likely prospect to follow Sadat's lead? Or do you just figure it'll take a period of time and maybe the person will come along as someone not even in prominence today? I mean, judging today, I believe the next in line should be Saudi Arabia. I do not believe that King Hussein will move unless he will have the support of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the United States of America. Do you feel that historically, and of course you've been in government for many, many years, do you feel that historically the United States has applied too much pressure and inappropriate pressure on the state of Israel to make concessions with its Arab neighbors? No, I don't think so. I think we have committed our own mistakes the United States to commit at some mistakes. But when I look at the picture from an overall point of view, not judging you know, a wrong move here or a wrong move there, by and large, it became clear to the countries here that Washington means peace as Moscow means conflict or the continuation of conflict. So if I judge by the intention and overall picture, I believe that the United States played, by and large, a constructive role in making peace in that area. There are, th there are those who say that the smartest thing the PLO could do, even though doing it would be a lie, to really get America to apply incredible pressure on the State of Israel would simply be to say, we as an organization recognize Israel's right to, to exist, and we accept Resolution 242, even though in practice they would be the same PLO. Would simply the mouthing of those words by Yasser Arafat, in your opinion, be meaningful in terms of the reality of the situation? You know, I'm afraid it's a highly hypothetical question 
because the smartest things that the PLO can do from its own point of view is to continue to exist. This is a coalition of seven or eight different groups who disagree with each other and they compete for the most extreme approach to the Israeli problem. So Yasser Arafat can remain the leader of the PLO as long as he applies the lowest common dominator. And I think deep in his heart, he doesn't look for a solution of the problem, but for the existence of his organization. Well, obviously, if the problem is solved, then the PLO has got to go away. Yes, sir. Why, in your opinion, has there never developed in this long historical period, especially since 67 in particular, an Arab leader of almost comparable note so that, for example, in the United States, whenever Palestinians are talked about, the name you hear over and over again is that of Arafat. Why, in your opinion, has not perhaps a mayor on the West Bank or some other Palestinian leader come out for the more moderate, realistic position, recognizing, telling his people the truth, Israel is not going to go away, no matter how many raids, no matter how many attacks, and, and, and have somewhat of a competing force against the Arafat PLO terrorist line? The answer is a very simple one. The penalty for taking a separate position is simply too high. And they, it, they will kill him in plain terms. So, I mean, when you talk with the leaders privately, well, they talk sense. But to make it public means for them to endanger their own life and the lives of their family. The, rea the reality of the situation then is that to speak that out loud, you would in all likelihood be killed. The Arab leader yes, would sir. be killed. You see, terrorism, when you have a terroristic organization, don't forget that this endangers the, member, the members of that organization as much as it endangers their opponents. You know, there was a very nice book by Gillas about the war in Yugoslavia. Actually, the two conflicting groups in Yugoslavia between Tito and Mikhailovich killed more Yugoslavs than the Nazis did. I mean, either you have a democratic organization, then you may have different views and voices, but when you have a terroristic organization, there is no room but for one voice. And by the way, the dictator himself is a victim. Is vulnerable himself. Yes. And of course, it would seem that the best example in the present day is what's happening in Iran. In Iran, and also what happened, you see, take the example of the attack on the synagogue in Vienna. Well, Mr. Kreisky stood up and said, well, this is not the PLO, it's a different organization. What sort of a consolation is it to us? It shows that if the PLO stops, there is another group which will take over. The problem is the whole logic of extremism, of terror, of killing, of lack of respect for human life. And it works in both directions. But tragically, if Arafat were having a private discussion with a moderate Arab, Arafat's position would be, especially in the United Nations, that terror absolutely works. Because in terms of the American media, as I've said, by far the best known Palestinian is Arafat and his organization. They've been on the cover of Time magazine. And he would argue that by the terrorist acts, we have cowed Europe. We have made Europe very, very fearful of us and that by committing such acts, we will get the concessions we want. Is there any logic to that position? I wonder, you know, making headway in the media doesn't mean that you make headway in the reality. You can have your picture on all the papers on earth, but this doesn't lead to a real solution. As a matter of fact, serious people who understand the situation realistically would not consider Arafat as a partner that you can sit down and talk sense and reach an agreement. You know, President Carter made it public that in his own private conversations with the Arab leaders, all of them, without exception, did not demand 
the creation of a Palestinian state, and they weren't as enthusiastic about Arafat as you read in the papers. Now you must decide where does the realistic course of action and postures lead you to? Well, surely the press is impressed by, you know, drama, great declarations, all this is news. Just as crime is news domestically, that's what make, makes the front pages. Very much so. But I believe that Arafat is bringing a tragedy on the Palestinian people. Please understand me. I'm for an agreement with the Palestinian people. I'm for, for a just solution of their problems. We don't want to live in conflict with them. But the story goes on almost 40 or 50 years. It started with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who called the Arabs to leave the country, who actually made an alliance with Hitler. I mean, everything led him to the wrong conclusion to this very day. Would there be any leader who can take control on an armed, divided coalition, the story would be different. But today, the structure of the coalition makes for its policies, which is very, very complicated. Well, is it your position and the position of labor that you would give back the West Bank and Gaza in the sense of giving them total autonomy over their domestic affairs for peace, as opposed to the view that says the West Bank and Gaza Judea and Samaria were promised to the Jewish people by God, and it can never be given away. So what is your position on that? It's a little bit more complicated and more simpler at the same time. I mean, we would give back parts of it, not all of it. We would keep those areas which are necessary to secure our own borders, to make defensible borders around Israel. But our view is that out of our own free choice, we do not want to become a dominating people. We do not want to dominate the fate of 1.3 million Arabs or Palestinians against their own wish. That's how many there are in the West Bank and Gaza. Yes, that's more or less the number in the two areas. And we don't want to turn over Israel from its true character, which is a Jewish state, which means a state built on moral foundations, not just on strategic considerations, and for its remaining a purely democratic country. So we would sacrifice land in order to maintain the true character of our people in the future. Then I would like to add another point. Sure, go ahead. And that is, you know, the idea of labor Zionism, as we see it, is that we shall live on our own travail, on our own labor. We wouldn't like to see any other people working instead of us, as we wouldn't like to see any other powers defending us. Modern Judaism, in our view, is a Jewish state where Jewish people are able to defend themselves and to make a living out of their own toil or intellectual efforts. And to you, that concept is really more important than simply a philosophical or religious view of holding on to land for historical or biblical reasons. Yes, sir. Particularly when the holders of this view are complicating their own life, because greater Israel means Transjordan as well. So they gave up already part of the whole of Israel. So they are also compromising in their principles. And we believe it is wiser here. When we are strong, and I believe Israel is today strong, and the Arabs maybe are divided and a little bit weaker, we think this is the best season to negotiate a peace that can be acceptable to Israel without sacrificing her real needs of self-defense. Mr. Perez, the, the 1981 election was very confusing to Americans. We, kept, to reading, the <laughs> yes. we, we kept reading in the polls that yes. labor, perhaps for the first time in the history of the state of Israel, was not even going to need a coalition, that you would win a majority of seats in the Knesset. 
And then within a period of two to three months, even though rampant inflation continued, the basic problems still seemed to remain, yet there was essentially a flip-flop. And although the vote was very, very close, uh, it was sufficient to give Prime Minister Begin another opportunity to form a government, which he has done. What happened in those last two or three months to change the complexion of the situation so drastically? The dynamics of elections were very strong, almost dramatic. In our judgment, what happened is that there was a change of the Minister of Finance, and instead of his predecessor, who says, we don't have money, we can't give anything, the country is in a terrible shape, all of a sudden came in a Minister of Finance who says, well, you can have whatever you want. And he created a sense of easy, almost pleasant economic situation. Now, you know, it has an effect upon the voter. And I'm convinced that this was the thing that really turned the mind of some voters, not all of them, from us to the Likud. Then there were... Let me ask you this. In your, in your judgment, was that done for purely political reasons? Undoubtedly. Okay. We said it so publicly, and we know it now because now we are going to pay the price of the elections. We had the pleasure before the elections. Now we have to pay the cost of a very complicated menu. But in purely political terms, it worked. It worked very much, in my judgment, more than it is permitted in a normal democratic assumption. The second point was, in my judgment, a chain of dramatic events in the domain of security, like the bomb bombardment, the strike on the Iraqi reactor, which made a very deep impression upon some of the voters. You know, on the more of the strike, labor went down, according to some pollsters, by 10 seats, and the Likud went up by 10 seats. So, I mean, a terrible gap was created, I thought, on the more of the strike that we have lost the elections. And then, uh, I wouldn't like to criticize Mr. Begin, but I must admit that I'm not Why the greatest. Why not? Why not? <laughs> well, I do it in my country. <laughs> I don't do it abroad. But I can't describe myself as the greatest admirer of his performing in uh, public before the elections. I have my own criticism, and I said it very clearly during the elections. And of course, it was reported in <coughs> Time and Newsweek and everywhere in the state. So everyone is aware in, in, in America of the fact that it was an extremely, not only heated, but terms were used like liar. And uh, this seems to have been an incredibly nasty, personal, in many ways vicious type of election campaign. Do you see more of that in the future? Or were there, were there special conditions existing in 81 that caused it, it to become that personal and that seemingly vindictive? At least that's how it was re reported in the, in the American media. Well, for the future, I hope not. But it was a campaign where the Likud was able to paint its position in black and white, where we do have a more complicated, objectively speaking, position on foreign affairs, on economy. I mean, it needs a little bit of sophistication in an age of short sentences, of a televised impatience to explain in detail our approach, which I believe is more realistic and more responsible. But even in the age of color television, when you have a black and white picture, you are better off. So that, I would say, is a general problem we were facing. Yet, in spite of all that, when you analyze the elections carefully, Mr. Begin got 719,000 votes. We got 709,000 votes. The difference is of 10,000. We went up. Excuse me. Excuse me. Two seconds, we'll have another time. He was the one who 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 was the
אחד, שתיים, שלוש, ארבע, חמש, שש. I was saying that uh, while Mr. Begin get 719,000 votes, we got 709,000, the difference being of 10. Hardly a smashing victory. Very far from. I mean, actually, we came out with equal forces. But Mr. Begin went up from 45 seats in the parliament to 48 seats. We went up from 31 seats to 47 seats. So while you mean in terms of the previous representation and the previous Knesset? Exactly so. I mean, while he gained three seats, we gained 16, which means an addition of 60 percent to our previous strengths. But it's very interesting to see where from did he gain the seats. He was in a coalition with the religious parties. They numbered. Uh, 12, 5, 17. They've lost seven seats. The out, religious parties? Yes. Out of the seven, three went over to Mr. Begin. So actually, the coalition, the previous coalition, simply shifted from one point to another point. But you must understand that we do not have an American system. It is not here a competition between two persons or two parties. One wins, the other loses. It is a coalition. Today, we are on equal terms with the Likud. They have 48 seats. We have 48 seats in the parliament. And the problem, the real problem of the elections, is that the religious parties who lost in numbers gained in influence. In influence. They were the ones to decide to go with Mr. Begin because of their nationalistic positions and because Mr. Begin was ready to make more concessions to them. As you know, America has the so-called moral majority. Israel seems to have the moral minority, which well, wields power all out of influence to its numbers. I would agree about majorities and minorities. <laughs> about moral, I think all of us are moral. I wouldn't make moral later monopoly of anybody. Well, as a matter of fact, when I interviewed uh, Shmuel Tamir, the former Minister of Justice, he made the point that he felt that the parliamentary system of government that Israel has is no longer really in Israel's best interest, if it ever was, and he would like to see a presidential system similar either to the U.S. or to the French system, which began with when de Gaulle came back to power. How do you feel about that? I agree with him on the criticism of the existing system. I think we have to change it. But whether to go to a presidential system or to a real parliamentarian system, say like in England, one man constituency, I would rather go the parliamentarian road. Even in the United States, the presidential system is a very complex one. Let's not forget the United States legally at least, is a federation of 50 states and with a very subtle and complicated negotiations between the White House, the Congress, the two houses, the amount of compromises and agreements that you have to go through is tremendous. Now let's not forget that Israel is like a small state in size like the United States. Now to build, say, a Senate, a House of Representatives, a president, a Supreme Court, will demand such a huge administration, both in numbers and in operation, that I believe it, it is not really necessary. And, go ahead. I would rather like to see the British system, which I believe fits more a small country like Israel. Another thing which is confusing to Americans, and of course I, I, I assume that it's more or less tied to the coalition form of government by necessity, 
which you have to have, and that is the frequent number of resignations of very, very high officials. And secondly, the kind of shooting off of splinter parties, like Moshe Dayan formed a party, and once again, before the election was predicted, he was going to gain 16 seats. He actually got two seats. And of course, years ago, when you're sitting in front of uh, uh, Ben-Gurion's photograph, even Ben-Gurion, who was in many ways the founder of the State of Israel at one time, moved out from the Labor Party, formed a faction known as Rafai, and I believe that you and Moshe Dayan were with him in that movement. Why is that, the, the splinter movements and the resignations, for, for example, Dayan from the Foreign Ministry, Wiseman from the Minister of Defense, and, and uh, Prime Minister uh, Ben-Gurion, as, as you well know, resigned twice from uh, the office of Prime Minister. Well, it has something to do with the system of elections. The system of election, the existing one in Israel, pays for every division and punishes for every union. Because if uh, you have a national and proportional system, the more you divide, the more chances you got to become more notorious, more important in the parliament. Take the existing government. It is a coalition based on 61 members out of 120. Now it means a majority of a single man, but it is not a single man who is the majority. Each one of the 61 members who consists in that majority has a tremendous bargaining power. If he will step over from one party to the other party, he can decide the fate of the government. As a result, for example, 40 out of the 60 ones were appointed as ministers, deputy ministers, head of committees and so on. Still you have 21 members who are dissatisfied. So the mere system and the very delicate structure of the coalition creates tremendous problems. I would really like to see two parties, one winning the other in the opposition, like two wings of a bird, one operating, the other balancing. But under our system, you can change the government in midstream. And it depends upon one man, two men, three men, and the temptation to do it are very high. As a matter of fact, even though Begin was able to form a coalition after the elections of 1981, Many, many people think, and I assume you and Labor hope, that his government is relatively short-lived and there will be new elections. It's a possibility which I would consider very realistic. Uh, Mr. Perez, as you know, Americans are endlessly fascinated by political personalities. And whenever there is an article in the United States about the Labor Party and your name comes up, they always talk, it's almost a cliche, because the phrase that is always used is that Perez and Rabin are bitter foes. And the only thing that's really told to Americans is that you're basically fighting for who will become the next prime minister of the state of Israel. Could you give us some background of all that? The Perez-Rabin dispute. I don't think that I'm the right person to do it. I don't consider myself objective on that subject. I would really love to have your very biased, subjective point of view, and I'm sure, I'm no, sure the audience No, would. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I don't think it's fair. But, you know, we had a convention of our party, and there was a contest between Mr. Rabin and myself in a secret ballot. I mean, before the convention, we have a census of the party, with, with a very large number of people registering to the party. And then we had a sort of what you would call in America primaries. In that convention, I gained a majority of 72%, which is a clear-cut majority, unprecedented in the life and the history of the party. And uh, I mean, clearly, I was elected to do my job. Yet, in our concept, we are not a single man party. I mean, contrary to some other parties, we have a cult of personality where you have one leader, 
who decides on almost every single issue. I don't think I have to be terribly perceptive to realize you're talking about the Likud and Begin, since he's really been the head of that party since Israel was formed. Yes. Yes, that's true. I think we are more of a democratic party in real terms. And since, you know, we are the same age group, in our party we changed in the last 30 years six times the leadership. In the Likud it was never changed. So it's a highly competitive party. And you know, our founding fathers almost disappeared in a very short while, maybe in five years. And our age took over. I mean, it became, if you want, for a while, like an orphan house. And I was elected to be the chief orphan of it. <laughs> so it takes a little bit of time for a clear cut hierarchy in moral terms is being established in the power. Well, actually, in the Israeli system, in terms of intra party politics, it would seem that the real battle is to become the chairman and leader of the party, because whoever is chairman and leader of the party, if that party gains a majority of seats in the Knesset, he automatically will become prime minister, as opposed to the U.S. system, of course. Yes, I mean, in our case, you are being elected to three posts at the same time. The chairman of the party, the candidate for prime minister, and the head of the list. So, I mean, this is in clear terms the person who is being elected to, the, to those three posts is the candidate of the party to be the prime minister. One thing that made a very big impression on me in reading Golda Meir's book, of course, some of the principles that you enunciated of labor Zionism, and obviously in terms of the book on her life, she enunciated them very, very strongly, the whole compelling reason for leaving Russia coming to Palestine, the early struggles. And she obviously considered her so herself a socialist, and sometimes that term is misunderstood in the United States. But I really saw in her book an incredibly bitter disappointment in the socialist parties of other countries. And the specifics she gave, of course, was in the 1973 war when in the early days Israel really had its back to the walls. And she had only the highest praise for President Nixon in terms of keeping every commitment he ever made to her and to the state of Israel. And of course, when the supplies and the planes and the tanks were being delivered on the C-5 galaxies, she was very bitterly disappointed about the fact. It didn't seem like you were asking very much from European allies, a fellow democratic nation, to simply allow the planes to land in the Western democracies to get fuel, to be refueled, and they wouldn't even permit that. Does that, and, and then of course you think back historically uh, when in 1947 the exodus was sent back to Germany by a labor British government. Does that type of experience make you somewhat cynical or pessimistic in terms of the solidarity of the socialist labor movement on a worldwide scale? I know that was a pretty long-winded question. Not necessarily. So it's like Republicans and Democrats. Depends very much upon the personalities. I mean, uh, there uh, is a description of what Nixon did in the book of Golda Meir. And so he is an, a Republican, and General Eisenhower is a Republican. You can't say that this is the same policies. The same goes also for Democratic presidents. The same is true about socialist leaders. There are different socialist leaders. Say in France, there was Guimolet, who helped us very much. I hope Mitterrand will follow. In England, there were leaders who supported us very strongly. There were leaders who, you know, became too expedient in their approach. I personally believe that the socialists are not terribly strong on foreign affairs. They're in terms of their understanding? In terms of their training in foreign, in foreign uh, affairs. You know, socialism in the European countries is an answer to a domestic situation. In our case, we are a labor party, 
which by force of events was really busy and trained in foreign and defense matters. Most of our energies and most of our talents were really consumed by the real needs of the country. And then we are also a special brand of socialism. I mean, for us, socialism does not begin with Marx and doesn't wind up with Engels. It begins with our prophets, Isaiah and Amos, and even Moses. We think the Ten Commandments is basically a socialist declaration. I, I have a feeling the religious parties would, would not agree with that statement. Well, I wouldn't agree with them. I think that Judaism is basically a faith, not a church. It is a moral commitment and not a structure of clergymen or an order which is being conducted by flesh and blood once the Lord said his word. In our concept, Judaism is a straight relationship between a person and the Lord who is conscious, whatever you will call it, and there is no intermediary in it. And Judaism is basically a moral concept, more than anything else. Mr. Perez, let me ask you a question now, which I, I don't really expect to get a, a direct answer to, but I and the American public will be interested in see how you answer it, and that is uh, the question of whether or not Israel has nuclear weapons. Well, Israel declared, I mean, you can refer either to the technological side or to the political side. I shall speak on the political side. Israel declared that she will never be first to introduce nuclear weapons to the Middle East. And I would trust her declaration. I wouldn't go further than that. And anyone, any American with an IQ over 100 would take that statement to mean that Israel does, in fact, have nuclear weapons. But I won't, I won't ask the question again. Well, about IQs, I think you may find Even a lower IQ. <laughs> Even with a lower IQ. You may find a variation of uh, concepts. But I wouldn't like to go more than that. Obviously, everyone understands why the American, is that it? All right, finish. Oh, okay. you're, you're very kind to give us this much time. Yes. I really appreciate it. Can you, can you sit down? Okay. Okay.